2023, but with that, we begin a brand new sermon series, a new sermon series that we're entitling First Things First. And in this series, we're going to see from God's Word who we are, and from that, how it is that we should live, who we are as Christians, and how we as a church, how we as Christians should live. And to do that, we're going to spend seven weeks each week looking at one of our seven core values as a church. These core values are new to our church in that they were just adapted this fall, but they're not new to the Christian faith. They're not new to the church. In fact, they have existed, they've been exercised in the church since the church's formation 2,000 years ago. So amidst this, season, this series, we're going to look at the church's formation 2,000 years ago, and we're going to see how these guiding principles, how they defined who the church was, the early church, how the early church lived these principles out, and what impact it will still have on our lives, on our church, and the world in our day. And so we start, we're, at, we're, we're just read, Acts chapter 4, verses 23 through 31, and it's example of our first core value, a public and a private commitment to prayer. We begin the day with a study of prayer. And with any study of prayer comes the question that Christian author Philip Yancey asks and answers beautifully, faithfully to Scripture in his book, Prayer, Does It Make Any Difference? The question is, does prayer make any difference? Does the act of talking, the act of communicating, whether you are communicating once, hurts, habits, hang-ups, joys, trials, tribulations, does communication with God through prayer, either verbally, corporately, individually, silently, programmatically, ritually, freely, structurally, does prayer matter no matter how you pray or what it is that you pray about? Does prayer actually make a difference? And the resounding answer to that question we see from the example of the early church that we're going to study today is an absolute yes. So we pick up the early church. Peter and John go re return to their own people, meeting other Christians on their release, on their release from jail. And that's the, what, the release that's in question as we turn to verse 23. The early church is, is in the very, very early of, uh, moments of their existence, the very early moments of their movement of God that they are. But a lot has already happened during the span of their short existence and this movement when we pick their story up. We read in verse number 4 of chapter 4 that the early church has grown from those original 11 cowering disciples in a room upstairs in a house in Jerusalem to now they've grown to 5,000 people who have called upon and believed in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So numbers-wise, the church has exploded in a very, very short period of time. And any time that a group of people, doesn't matter what a group of people is gathered around, but any time a group of people grows in a very short amount of time from 11 to 5,000, that's going to get a lot of other people's attention. And it did. And add on top of that, that this explosive growth, it grabbed the attention that the explosive growth was coming about through signs and wonders. And now the early church has a lot of high-powered, high-prestige, high-authority people's attentions. And those, as often is the case when things like this happen, those high-powered people, those people with authority that they're trying to, to hold on to, they are threatened by the explosive growth of this movement that they see as a threat. And we see that in the early church. The early church is experiencing rapid growth, 11 to 5,000 in weeks, but they are experiencing this growth two ways, through the primarily through the public, powerful preaching of the Word of God in the name of Jesus Christ, and again, signs and wonders, healings and miracles. Healings and miracles that are all meant for the purpose of confirming that that which Peter and John preached in Jesus' name from God's Word is, in fact, God's all-powerful Word. So not only was there this new religious movement preaching in this guy's name that the religious leaders have already literally tried to kill. They were successful in killing him for three days. But their movement is growing more explosively than before when they tried to kill Jesus. Now God is confirming their teaching on the very public stage of the temple courts through signs and wonders, through miracles and healings. Right, so think about that. These same religious leaders have already tried to kill Jesus. We know that that did not go the way that they planned it. 
Now Jesus, God's power, God himself is no longer walking the streets of Jerusalem or any other town in the flesh, but now God's power, God himself is now working not just through one man's flesh, but it's working through any man, any woman who calls on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit. Now God himself, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, defeating the, the religious leader's plan of, of killing Jesus, now that same power is being exercised not through one, but through many. Through any who call upon and believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And God is working through his Holy Spirit, proving that Jesus is exactly who these people are saying that he is. The Son of God, God's Messiah. So that is what is happening here. And so the religious leaders certainly have taken notice, and they certainly do not like what they are seeing, what they are experiencing. And so at the beginning of chapter 4, the religious leaders come to Peter and John as they are preaching the word of God in Jesus' name, and, they, and by the power of his resurrection. It's evening time, so they seize Peter and John and have them thrown in prison overnight. And so that this release that we picked their story up is, is where Peter and John come from. They've just gotten out of jail. But before that, the religious leaders call Peter and John to them in the morning. They ask him how. They ask him, in whose name are you doing all these things, preaching all these things and performing all these signs and wonders? We read that Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, says boldly that it is Jesus in Jesus' name in which we do these things. Even throwing in the, the jab that, that it's the same Jesus Christ whom you individuals has crucified that we are doing these things. They use the word of God then to show that salvation is found in no other name but Jesus Christ, God's anointed. And then verse number 13, and this gets us to the answer of our question, does prayer make any difference? Verse number 13 of chapter 4 says, when they, the religious leaders, saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were just unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. What difference does prayer make in the life of a participant in prayer, in the life of a believer? Well, prayer takes a believer, a participant from cowardness to courage. Think about the change, about the sheer astonishment that we should read these words with. That these descriptors, descriptors, that these adjectives would be applied to especially Peter, knowing what we know about Peter. Peter is the same guy who just a few weeks ago was standing by a fire at midnight, questioned by a mere slave girl who has no standing, no authority, no power, certainly not what these religious leaders have. He's questioned by these slave, this slave girl by a fire to if he even knows or is even associated with Jesus. And in that moment, Peter did not possess the courage. Peter did not possess the power to admit that he even knew Jesus Christ, much less that he possessed belief that Jesus Christ is who he says he was, the Son of God. Right? Peter there is anything but courageous. courageous. Even immediately perceived following Jesus' resurrection by a campfire in John chapter 21. There we see Peter is still anything but courageous. We studied that in, in Bible study this fall. Peter and the other apostles in the opening days of the church era, post-Christ ascension, they are huddled together in fear in an upper room in Jerusalem. But yet even huddled together in fear, Peter and the other disciples did something that took them from, from their cowardness, to this courage that they now possess in Acts chapter 4. What was it? Well, they prayed. Acts chapter 1, verse 12. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called Mount of Olives. This is after Jesus' ascension. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. The early church went from their cowardness to courage through constant prayer. They prayed. They practiced what prayer is. They practiced communion, fellowship, relationship, communication with God. 
And another facet of prayer is they practice communion, fellowship, relationship, communication with one another. They were together. Prayer brings us together. That's what prayer is, and that's what prayer does. It takes us from our cowardness and lack of strength, whatever we are weak in and whatever we are cowering before, and in the same strength that raised Jesus Christ from the dead, the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit takes us from our cowardness, takes us from our isolation by ourselves to courage and strength in the Lord and in the community of the Lord's people. So, does prayer make any difference? Yes, a resounding yes to that, that question. But what does prayer, what difference does prayer make? Prayer takes us, again, from our cowardness to the Lord's strength, power, and courage. So, we've opened, as we begin this morning, the answers to our, our what questions. What is prayer, and what qu difference does prayer make in our lives? Now I want to unpack the, the how questions. How tangibly and applicably to our lives can, I, can we pray? How can we, how does prayer, how if we participate, will prayer work in our lives? Verses number 23 through 31, where we are rooted today of Acts 4, give us a brilliant example and answers to these questions. Again, we pick up Peter and John, the early church, upon their release from jail at the hands of of the religious leaders, even the religious leaders, even they, haters of Jesus and the Jesus movement, even the religious leaders, they confess and they notice that there is a tangible difference in Peter and John and, and all those original 5,000 believers. They're just not sure what to do with the difference in Peter and John and those, and those early believers. They're not sure what to do at this point, and so they end up just releasing Peter and John. Peter and John go back to the believers, and what do they do, and, and how do they do it? Well, again, they, they join back together, and they, they pray. They begin to pray, not focused first on themselves, not first focused on their circumstances, or even the fact that they just spent the night in prison. They begin their prayer focused, in verse number 24, on the sovereign Lord in the NIV. The NIV translates the word in the original language, sovereign Lord, and that word in the original language, it, it, it demonstrates complete submission. It demonstrates complete reliance on the one being deemed sovereign Lord. It illustrates a complete commitment and reliance by the early church to the Lord, to his authority, and the carrying out of his will. And this act of reliance and submission to begin the prayer of the early church even in the most pressing of circumstances, it shows us as we begin that for those of us, that when we participate in prayer, that when we as a church practice prayer, prayer will renew our perspective. Peter and John, each member of the 5,000 original believers, Peter we know more clearly though than, than any one of these 5,000, they were all human beings. They were all just like us. They all seemingly fell flat on their face more than they were able to stand up straight. They all had fears. They all experienced and were in this moment experiencing hardships. They had just come through being thrown in jail. And in those hard moments, I, I know I don't have to spend a whole lot of time convincing you of this, in those hard moments, in, its, in those hard moments of life, it's hardest to maintain a healthy perspective. It's hardest to maintain a healthy perspective of God, of our life, of our circumstances, you name it. It's hard to maintain a healthy perspective. But the early church's example shows us that even amidst the hardest circumstances, Jesus is willing and able through prayer to reset our perspective, to reset our perspective and view. How does he do that? Well, he does that through inviting us to set our eyes not on our hard circumstances, not on our circumstances, but on his greatness. Set our eyes on his power, on his perfectly good rule and dominion. Right? The early church says, Sovereign Lord, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Our father David, you, the, God speaking through David, says, Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord, against his anointed one. 
Indeed, even Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy spirit who, who against your holy servant Jesus whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Now they say none of this or anything that has come what we read here in the early church's word is them saying that that none of what has happened even Jesus's death on a cross, even their imprisonment last night, and nothing that, that is to come. Nothing was done without the Lord's prior knowledge that this was going to come, and none of this was done with outside of the Lord's power. They say, they even mention a few very specific kings that we studied in our time in our Christmas series. They say kings. Even these religious leaders who just threw us in jail, even kings and rulers and authorities in our days and those that sit in the most powerful places in our day, they sit under God's power, under Christ's power. And what the, Holy Spirit, or what the early church exemplifies for us is they allow prayer. They allow their knowledge of the word of God. They allow their knowledge of God to draw them, to draw their eyes away from their pretty dire circumstances and to their supremely powerful and good God. Friends, if and when and where we do the same, God will renew our perspective as well. He will set our eyes not on the immediacy of our circumstances, but on the supremacy of God's power and faithfulness. Prayer renews our perspective, and it also reinstates our prowess. What is prowess? Well, according to to the Oxford Language Dictionary's prowess is bravery in battle. And friends, brothers and sisters, Peckway Church, we are in a battle. There are forces that we can see every day and forces that we cannot see that are every day trying to distort our perspective, trying to remove our prowess, trying to take away our bravery, trying to remove our courage, remove our boldness in the battle that we fight in the strength of the Lord. For the early church, the threats were prison and hell, and those are very loud, very glaring threats to their boldness in the Lord. But brothers and sisters, as 21st century American believers, as we are, our threats may not be quite so loud, but they are just as glaring and deadly. Threats to our prowess in the Lord come not in the form of, of martyrdom or, or prison, imprisonment, but oftentimes they come in, in, in the form of indifference and false security. We can get along pretty well playing it safe as Americans and American Christians with or without the Lord, with or without prayer, with or without prowess in the Lord from prayer. Right? Our lives are not being threatened for our faith. Christians on the internet like to make it sound like we have a really hard time of it, but we actually have it really, really good in this nation, and particularly this county in which we live, sometimes too good. Because we really don't need prowess often from the Lord. We really don't need to, to pray to be bold in the Lord because our faith is, is not getting us into persecution. And so we can become blind to the reality that we do, even for us, as, as blessed as we are, we need prowess from the Lord in our spiritual battle. We are not equipped for the battles that come our way, oftentimes because we have not prayed. We have not communed with God. We don't commune with other believers. And so when the battle comes our way, we shrink into what appears as safety from 21st century America. Brothers and sisters, the Apostle Paul reminds us that clearly our battle is not and never against flesh and blood, but it's against the rulers and the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. And so I warn you, don't fall into a false sense of security. Don't forsake the prowess in the fight that, that prayer brings to you, that, that Jesus Christ through prayer brings to you. And allow prayer to reset your priorities. Verse number 29, these are some of the most encouraging verses that we have in Scripture. They read that now, the, this is the prayer of the early church, now Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant Jesus. 
After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. Isn't this, when we think about it, what the words of this, the content of this prayer of the early church, isn't it, isn't it crazy? They've just spent the night in prison. They are smart enough to know that this is probably not going to be the last night that they're going to spend in prison. That it's not going to be the last time that they face harsh opposition to their proclamation of the gospel of Jesus. And what do they say? Do they say, Lord, we don't want to do this anymore. Lord, we, we don't want this mission anymore. They, they don't even say, Lord, change our circumstances or Lord, take away this opposition. No, they don't say change our circumstances. Instead, what they say is, Lord, change us. They say, Lord, consider our threats. They, they don't turn a, a blind eye to their challenging circumstances. They don't pretend like they're not in a bit of a, a pickle. They, they acknowledge that there are challenges in their circumstances. But they say, Lord, consider our threats and give us boldness to meet these threats. Give us boldness in your power and with your priorities in mind. With your mission still at the forefront of our minds and our lives. If I were in these 5,000 people's shoes, I think I would have been smart enough to know that, again, this was probably not going to be my last night in jail. That those religious leaders who have already had Jesus executed, that they're not going to be done opposing us. And somewhere in my prayer, I would have said, hey, God, could you, could you stop them? Could you make this a little easier? Maybe even take away these threats and oppositions? But this is not what the believers do. Rather, they say, Lord, would you help us? Would you keep our priorities, your priorities, amidst these threats? What an example of faith and staying on mission with God amidst all sorts of threats, attempting to, to throw us off mission and take us away from God. So the question is, will we follow their example? Will we allow God to craft and reset our priorities to always be his priorities? And then finally, will we craft our prayers to reflect his purpose, our purpose from him? Verse 31, read it again. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God boldly. Again, you might be asking yourself, you might be thinking in the back of your mind, when is prayer? When will my prayers, when will our church's prayers make the most difference? When will they be most effective? When will, they be, when will there be the most visible answers to my prayer? When will we clearly see God's power answering our prayer? Well, to answer this, when our prayers are most effective is when they most reflect our purpose. When they most reflect our God-given purpose of, of helping people know and follow Jesus. When they are most centered on making disciples of all nations. When they are most centered on baptizing them in the same name of the Lord in which we have prayed, in, which, in the same name of the Lord in which we have been baptized into. The early church prayed in this way that we have studied this morning. They prayed for boldness to continue to preach God's word in the face of man's opposition. God answered in such a powerful and tangible way that the Holy Spirit shook the place where they were meeting. But that shaking of a building by the Holy Spirit, it is not what we should be fascinated with or what we should seek to, to emulate in, in our lives or, or even in our church. But what we should seek to emulate, what we should be fascinated is amidst the, the building shaking, their faith wasn't shaken, right? These early believers amidst severe persecution, they were not thrown off the path of following the Lord and seeking to perform the Lord's will. How do we take possession of this message and, and live it out in our lives? Well, in my study for this message, I found an article by Bob Hostetler and that surveys seven different occasions when Jesus prayed during his time on earth. I would invite you, you can, you can Google search that and, and you can read the article, but I've boiled them down just to the three different ways for the sake of time this morning. When we see Jesus pray and, and when as Jesus followers we should, should commit to pray as well. And the first one is, is in all occasions. We see Jesus pray, for example, at his baptism. We see Jesus pray at funerals. We see Jesus pray at weddings. We see Jesus pray in joy. We see Jesus pray in loss. 
We see Jesus pray on special occasions. We see Jesus pray in solitude. We see Jesus pray with his disciples. What do we see Jesus doing? We see Jesus praying on all occasions. The glorious mystery that we will never understand of the incarnation of Christ that we just celebrated at Christmas is that God, Jesus Christ, both fully God and fully man, that the man who is fully God, that he would pray to God as a man. And that he would do that amidst all the same occasions and temptations of life that we still face to this day. Will prayer be a part of all the special, all occasions of your life, whether they're good or whether they're bad? And then, will prayer be the most, be a part of your life in the most demanding seasons of your life? Now, I would say this is probably the, the most easy, the, most, the place in our lives where we are most prone to pray is when we are struggling, when we're facing opposition, when we're facing hardships, right? We're going to be most drawn to pray when we feel we most need God's rescue from our circumstances, from our challenges. But the question that I would ask of us in this is, are we praying in these circumstances, not a, a me-centered prayer, right? Are we not praying in the way, are we praying in the way of the early church? Are we praying prayers like, God, take me out of these circumstances. God, smite this enemy. God, change this. God, do that. These times we might pray the most, but do we pray in the way that the early church exemplifies for us, that, that God would call us to pray? Again, not primarily focused on a change of our circumstances, but in a way that is focused on changing us amidst our circumstances in a way that gives us strength and prowess and boldness amidst our challenges. Pray like Jesus prayed. Pray like the early church prayed amidst demanding seasons. And then the final thing I would challenge you with is to pray in concert with others. It's to pray with the church. It's to pray with other believers. We see Jesus throughout his life and ministry. He escapes the crowds and the noise of life. Sometimes he prays alone in solitude with only he and his Father in heaven. But we also see Jesus escape the crowds and the noise of life and pray with a smaller group of like-minded believers. It was usually that three of Peter, James, and John. And so I challenge you, do not only pray in solitude, but pray in concert with others. Practically share that which is on your heart as we have already practiced this morning. Share with your church family that which is, is nagging at you, that which you are bringing before the Lord's throne of grace. Edie does a wonderful job of, of updating the prayer list, and she does not do that just so we have another sheet of paper in our bulletin. But she does that so that we, even when we are not together, can pray in concert together with one another. Join us at, at prayer meetings when we have the opportunity. Have a group of believers that you pray with in your circle. Pray amongst your marriages. Pray amongst your families. Pray with others. Prayer is powerful and effective, we read, when a prayer of the righteous person, the brother James tells us. Prayer is a powerful and effective when, when one made righteous by Christ prays. And so we can imagine how powerful and effective, easy for me to say, the prayers of many individuals made righteous by Christ will be. Pray on special occasions, just pray on all occasions. Pray and pray in the example of Christ in the early church, his example amidst the most demanding and challenging season. And always pray in concert with others. Pray and pray in this way. Pray for eyes to see the ways that the Lord, through prayer, is taking you from, from cowardice or focus on your circumstances. The courage that only comes by prayer and through our good and gracious God. So, let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, we do thank you for this study of your word and the example of your early church, how you have worked in men and women, how we have this clear example of work in men and women, taking them from, from just lostness and, and cowardice to, to bold courage in the proclamation of your gospel, Lord. 
It was, it was such a change in these men and women's life that even those that were, that were giving such strong, strong opposition to them and the religious, religious leaders, even they could not help but, but notice and acknowledge the change that you worked in their life, Lord. How you took them from these uneducated, ordinary men to these strong and courageous proclaimers of the gospel of Jesus Christ through the public preaching of your word and through the signs and wonders that you used to, to confirm your word and to draw people to you, to prove that you are exactly who you say that you are, the all-powerful Son of God, the one with whom all authority rests and all majesty seats. And so, Lord, we pray that, that we would follow these individuals, these early believers, their example, that we would commit to praying on all occasions, that we would commit to praying in the ways and with the priorities that, that you have given to us, Lord, to make disciples of all nations, to pray with that unseen spiritual battle in first in mind, Lord, to pray, a, pray that we would be equipped in that battle, pray that we would be equipped amidst the physical battles that come our way to boldly preach the word of God, proclaim the kingdom of God, Lord, amidst opposition, Lord. And Lord, I pray that, that as a church and as individuals, Lord, we would seek to always be molded and shaped by you through prayer, Lord. That we would seek to, to be mended where we need to be mended, Lord, but also cut where we need to be cut, Lord, to, to shave off any signs of sin, any practices of sin, any, any uh, follies with temptations that we would have in our life, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would do a powerful work in us, Lord. That when we read your word, that we would be convicted of our sin, repent of that sin, and continue to become more and more like your son, Jesus Christ. Knowing that as we do, our salvation is, is completely assured through the finished work of your son, Jesus Christ, but, but knowing that our goal is to continue to press on for the prize that you have given to us in Christ Jesus, Lord. Again, help us to be encouraged, Lord. And as we stand and sing here in a moment, a wonderful song of the faith, Lord. Help us to be reminded through our prayers, our time together with other believers, that you are truly great and you are truly faithful to all who call upon us. Lord, it is in Jesus' great and faithful name that we pray. Amen. At this time, I'll invite you to stand and sing. If you're using the hymnal, it's hymn number 28, Great is Thy Faithfulness, one of the great hymns of our faith. Stand and sing as you are able.